Well, in many ways, Bart, I suppose it could be said forged is kind of um, coming on the heels of, of what Misquoting Jesus did uh, in terms of raising big questions about the reliability of Scripture. Um, obviously, Misquoting Jesus was talking about textual variation and whether we've received the New Testament documents accurately and that sort of thing. Uh, in this book, you take a different kind of approach. Um, but uh, so, so tell us, what, what was the... Um, uh, sort of thinking behind this book um, what what particularly drove you to want to write a book about whether the the documents themselves are written by the people who claim to have written them yeah right well first thanks for having me uh, on the show again um, yeah when I wrote misquoting Jesus it was at the end of maybe 20 some years of doing research on the manuscripts of the New Testament and how difficult it is for scholars to know what the original text said so about five or six years ago, uh, after uh, doing that kind of research for so many years, I, I got interested in another field of New Testament scholarship that I had known about for years and years but hadn't uh, devoted myself to, which has to do with the authorship of uh, writings in early Christianity. Uh, we have lots of books from the early Christian church, not just those of the New Testament. We have lots of Gospels and Epistles and Acts and Apocalypses. And uh, most of these claim to be written by people who did not write them. Uh, they're, uh, the, the persons who wrote these books claim to be someone other than who they were. Usually they claim to be an apostle. Uh, and I got interested in this as a, as a claim because in almost all instances, these people were lying about who they were. And um, so that, that's that been a, a real interest of mine now for five or six years. I, and I decided to look into uh, what happened in the broader Greek and Roman worlds when people lied about who, who they were when they wrote books. And the thing that struck me uh, most as a New Testament scholar is that scholars for, for a couple hundred years have been saying that there are books like that in the New Testament, mm. that some of the New Testament books, in fact, are not written by the people who are claimed as their authors. And I thought it would be interesting to write a book for, for a lay audience, for a popular audience, about uh, these books, mainly about the books in the New Testament, and whether they really are written by the people who are claimed as their authors. Just as before we get into the, the technical discussions on this, and, and Daryl obviously is, is on the other side of this issue on today's program, um, what, is there any motivation behind this, Bart? Because uh, do you like to sort of put the cat among the pigeons? Um, <laughs> obviously what Misquoting Jesus did was take issues that are well known in scholarly circles, yes. but put them very much in the public sphere. And I have a feeling a lot of Christians, um, uh, church-going Christians, are sort of, to totally unfamiliar with this aspect of, yes. of, of their Bibles and, and, and this make them as a real shock to many yes. people that hey wasn't first and second Peter written by Peter yes. you know? and yes. if not who was it written by um, what what's is your hope to kind of make them worry doubt is it just to put the issue out there and make their own minds up Yes, the, uh, yeah, I get accused a lot of trying to stir up the pot and uh, making waves and causing problems. And, and actually, it's not my motivation. Uh, my motivation is to bring biblical scholarship to a lay audience. So when, when, I went to, when I went to seminary, I went to Princeton Theological Seminary uh, as, a, as a conservative evangelical Christian who believed that the Bible was the inerrant word of God. And so I was, I, was a, I was a believing Christian who believed in the Bible. And the more I did my research at Princeton Seminary, the more I learned there, the more I realized that most scholars, in fact, uh, have views that lay people don't know about. And it struck, it's always struck me as odd that pastors and pastors who go to seminaries outside of conservative evangelical seminaries, every other kind of seminary, Methodist, Episcopalian, Presbyterian, Lutheran, Roman Catholic, they, they, learn, they learn things about the Bible that they don't communicate to their parishes, to their, to their parishioners. And my motivation for writing books like Misquoting Jesus or like this book Forged is to make available to the reading public what students in mainline seminaries learn just as part of their education because I think it's important if people uh, revere the Bible if they read the Bible they should know what scholars say about the Bible and so that's that's my motivation well let's introduce our other guest on today's program now that's Daryl Bock who uh, as I mentioned is uh, from uh, Dallas Theological Seminary he's research professor of New Testament studies there Daryl great to have you joining us on the program today thank you for, for, for coming on the line my pleasure, and it's a pleasure to be here with Bart. Well, Daryl, um, you, you heard uh, sort of, you know, Bart's quick summary of, of his 
journey and um, where he's come to now. Um, you, though, have grappled with these issues and many more besides. You, you're very familiar with all the issues that, that Bart has brought up in his book. Um, uh, for you, uh, do you do, what do you make of, of what Bart is doing in kind of putting this stuff out to a more lay audience, a more popular audience? Uh, helpful, unhelpful? Should Christians be worried? Well, I actually think there is some value in what Bart is doing in terms of um, letting people know what the conversation is about the Bible among scholars. There is a huge conversation that's been going on in many cases on many of these issues for several hundred years. And uh, having people be aware of what that discussion actually is and, and the rationale for it is helpful. Now what happens is Bart produces his book, gives his reasons for why he thinks uh, so many of the materials in the New Testament are, are not written by the authors who claim to write them, and then what often happens, someone else comes along and gives the other side of the discussion, and so what in inevitably happens for people who are reading the materials is, is that they get one side of the discussion or the other normally. They don't get both, conver both uh, conversationalists kind of talking to each other at the same time, and that's kind of the value of what, what you do when you bring us both together in the same room and say, hey, let's have a conversation. Well, well, you're not quite in the same room, but it, it, certainly it's good to have you both on at the same time. And, and I should say, by the way, um, this, this was arranged at somewhat short notice, uh, it, but I wanted to make it happen. And, and my great thanks to you, Daryl, for stepping up uh, at short notice to, to do the program from uh, where you are in, in Germany. Um, I, what, what, it, I think anyone who has a whole website devoted to debunking them, that has to be um, a kind of interesting sort of... They, they must be saying something quite interesting and provocative. And, and Daryl, you're one of the contributors to uh, the airmanproject.com, um, which uh, is, is a website, actually, that... I'm sure you're aware of this at website, but um, of various scholars giving their reasons why they feel the Bible can be trusted um, against some of your uh, criticisms. Let's get into today's specific discussion. Let's look at some specific examples, okay? Um, I often quote a verse on this program, 1 Peter 3.15. Um, Always be prepared to give an answer f to anyone who asks you for the hope that you have, yet do it with gentleness and reverence. It would be quite annoying if I found out it wasn't actually Peter who uh, wrote those words. Um, but that is your contention, for instance, uh, that First and Second Peter were not actually written by Peter. They've been ascribed to Peter. It, 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 there, there's a, a reference within those letters to say that uh, this is Peter writing. Um, what, what are your reasons for thinking that, that those letters were not actually written by Peter? Well, first, let me, let me start by saying that, that the, the material I present in the book on First and Second Peter and, and in fact, on everything uh, is not based on uh, simply my, my personal odd points of view. Uh, these, are, these are points of view that are widely held in scholarship. Uh, I'd say outside of conservative evangelical circles, they are fairly standard uh, views. Uh, and so there's nothing uh, that's going to be shocking or nothing that, for example, Daryl will have read and said, oh, I never heard that before. Uh, in fact, this is all, this is standard stuff. Uh, and so with First and Second Peter, the first thing to say is that there's far less dispute about Second Peter than about First Peter. Uh, the majority of scholars don't think Paul wrote uh, Second Peter, including... Uh, don't uh, think Peter wrote Second Peter. That Peter didn't write <laughs> yeah. Second Peter, right? Uh, including a good number of conservative evangelical scholars who are just convinced that it's so different from First Peter when you read it in the Greek that it just looks like it's a different author. So, uh, but, but there are people who think, I think Daryl thinks that, that Peter wrote both First and Second Peter, and I don't think Peter wrote either one of them. Uh, and my, the main reason that m might be the most fruitful to focus on uh, for us is that uh, I think that, in fact, Peter, who was a lower-class, Aramaic-speaking fisherman from Galilee, a rural area, did not have an education, uh, as is true of the vast majority of people in the ancient world, and especially true in rural parts of the Roman Empire. There weren't schools uh, in Capernaum, where he, he grew up. Uh, there, there were not uh, places to learn, and whoever whoever wrote First Peter, the verse you just quoted, is a highly trained, highly literate Greek-speaking Christian um, who knows rhetorical techniques, who has a superb Greek vocabulary, 
Uh, and uh, it simply is not the lower class Aramaic speaking peasant from Galilee who didn't know how to read or write. So uh, a lot of people said, well, maybe maybe he used a secretary. Uh, and so he told the secretary what to write. Yeah, that, uh, that, that, uh, kind of like dictating to, uh, to, yeah. to, to, to your letters to your secretary. Yeah, so I have a whole section in my book showing why that probably didn't happen. Okay. <laughs> uh, that, that, prob- that we don't really have evidence that that, that that kind of letter writing technique happened in the ancient world. Mm. So if somebody wants to appeal to a secretary, then I usually ask them what the evidence is. Okay, great, great start, um, Daryl. Um, d- firstly, do you agree with with Bart's contention that the majority of scholars do um, wouldn't find his views controversial? That that what's um, sort of technically termed pseudography was common in uh, uh, you know that that various t- documents of the New Testament are not written by the authors that that the letters actually claim they are. No, Bart's right. There are many, many scholars who uh, accept pseudepigraphy as a part of what goes on in the New Testament. The debate is just how widespread it is, how many books it actually impacts. I think it would be fair to say that in Forged, as Bart says, well, he's taking very common positions, that in fact he has taken on really the maximal amount of Forged materials uh, that are suggested as, po- as opposed to a more minimal amount that some people would hold to who would accept theory. So, so for so, instance, with, with first and second Peter, uh, Bart says they're both not by Peter, whereas lots of scholars would say, well, I'm happy with first Peter, not second Peter sort of thing. That's right. Or if we come to the Paulines, we would have a, we would have a different range as how many people would accept, say, for example, Colossians or first Thessalonians or Ephesians would go back to uh, Paul versus being written by someone who, who's claiming to write in the name of Paul. Mm. So, um, so in that sense, when he portrays the book as being reflective of the general discussion out there, th- this, is, this is actually part of my basic complaint about the book, is that it, he represents himself as, as taking on common scholarly positions when, in fact, it depends where we are in the book and which issue we're talking about. On Second Peter, he's quite right. Most scholars are uh, arguing that Peter did not write Second Peter, and that is a very, very common position, and it is, it is also a position among some evangelicals. Um, but with regard to other books, it's much more controversial, and there's much more give and take, and there's much more debate, and, and the, the scale isn't quite tilted in the way that the impression of the book leaves. So that's one problem that I have. Mm. Uh, that's, a general, that's a general problem. Now let's come to the issue of Peter in particular and this idea of illiteracy for Peter uh, and whether or not he would function in this kind of a context. One of the sources that that Bart cites in working with this book is Catherine Hetzer's Jewish Literacy in Roman Palestine. Now, I hate to cite a technical work, but it's important here. Mm. Um, and she she is arguing that somewhere between 3 and 5% of the people have a high literacy rate in the culture. Um, Bart states that it's closer to 1%, so again, we've got this lean that I talk about that he writes with. But more importantly, she has other categories that he doesn't even mention that he discusses, that she discusses about the kinds of literacy that are going on. It's one thing to say someone is very, very technical with the language. It's another thing to say what someone might be able to do orally with the language. It, met, it also is another category whether someone has kind of a basic reading and writing capability as opposed to a high level. And so all these effective percentages you put on the literacy rates of what we're talking about. And she talks about in particular in the culture um, how tradesmen, uh, tend to be what she would call semi-literate and, and multilingual, and how secretaries in particular work with political and administrative kinds of documents, which are the kinds of documents that we have in, in the New Testament, that kind of thing. And so the impression that, that Bart leaves in the book that this is just kind of a really clear case of uh, asking for uh, an illiterate to write something literate I think uh, uh, pushes the scale too far to one side. What I see is I see someone who functioned not only in the land of Israel but outside the land of Israel as a missionary, traveled a lot, engaged a lot with with people. Now, he either had to have someone who helped him do that or he was capable of doing it himself. 
And, uh, and, and so uh, those kinds of impressions about Peter we don't even see anywhere in the book. Uh, uh, and just before Bart comes back, on the issue of him, the potential of him using a secretary that he essentially dictated and the secretary was the one who, as it were, was able to form the Greek, um, etc. What Do you disagree with Bart on, on that front? Yes, I do. And again, here's another study that Bart appeals to. There's a work by Richards, which which we both agree is, is the most detailed discussion of this. Um, and uh, he has updated the work from the from the time of the material that Bart is using. And he's very clear that there is this intermediate level that uh, Hetzer also mentions, uh, where we get uh, a figure who works in certain kinds of contexts and who has some type of role. Why, you know, in fact, this book asks the question, why would you even employ a secretary at all and not use all the skills that a secretary can bring to their task in working with a letter? And there's agreement that there are people writing these texts for Paul in certain of these letters. Mm. Well, let's give Bart a chance to respond, and feel free to now interact as we as we continue. Yeah, guys. so let me say some things about literacy. Uh, Hetzer is basing her argument on an article by Mayor Bari Lan, uh, which argues that probably 3% of Palestine could, could, re, could function liter- in terms of liter- literacy. Um, and uh, she's, ta- she's actually talking about reading literacy, uh, and, and Barilan herself says, not that 1% is literate, but that in some villages, probably 1% of people could read. Now, far fewer people can write than can read. These are separate, uh, these are separate skills in the ancient world. And so you have to ask, how many people in the ancient, in ancient place like uh, rural Palestine could read and write? Well, su- suppose you go with the higher figure, 3 to 5%. Who are these 3 to 5%? Uh, both studies are completely clear about this. These are urbanite people, people who live in major urban areas who are among the elite, who are, come from wealthy families, who can afford the time and leisure to train their children to read read and and to write. Uh, And so the question is, was Peter an upper class, elite aristocrat from an urban area in Palestine? The answer is no. He was nowhere near any of that. And so what are the chances that he could read or write? The chances are, are, uh, are extremely small indeed. One way to get to the answer is to ask ourselves, how many authors do we know from Palestine of the first century who wrote in Greek? Uh, I don't know, Daryl, if you know the answer to this, but uh, uh, I, I can tell you the answer. We know of one, Josephus. Of, of all of the many, many, many thousands of people, we have one author from the first century in writing in Greek. And, and Josephus says he couldn't write in Greek very well. He and needed that's help. All, that's, that's only if you exclude some of the evidence that we're actually debating. Um, that's the yeah, only yeah, yeah. I'm saying exclude the, exclude fine. this evidence and just look, just say we don't yeah, know about and this. How many, and how many material, how many actual sources do we have? That's my to point. Work with exactly, we because nobody wrote. No, well, if they did we, write, give me evidence. Debate, well, actually, there was a lot of writing done. We haven't we haven't been able to recover a lot of what's been. What's written. the evidence that, of it? Well. You can't. That's a, that's an argument from a kind of silence. No, I'm not arguing from silence. Of, You're saying there was writing there that we don't have, and I'm asking you what the evidence no, is. No, I'm saying it's there. I'm saying we're disputing whether certain people who come out of this background actually have this. Okay, name kind a non name a non Christian in Palestine who wrote in the first century in Greek. A non. Say it again. A non. N- name in somebody Pal- that we know of from Palestine who wrote in Greek outside of the materials we're talking about. Are we Are we going to talk about books? Are we going to talk about letters? Are we going to talk about ossuaries? Because Liter- once you start to do that, if I'm you talking look about at, a literary if writing. You look, if you, if you whoever wrote who, Whoever wrote a graffiti on an ossuary isn't the same kind of person who could write an epistle. So I'm saying well, we're who, not talking about graffiti on an ossuary. We're talking about we're talking about political administrative text. Part of what Hetzer studied was the whole mass of stuff that we have, not just not just letters, but business documents, that kind of thing. And what we see in this material is a range of languages. Fitzmaier wrote a famous article in which he was arguing for the, uh, in part, the uh, distribution of Greek in, in the Holy Land, uh, in which he showed a wide range of materials with people writing in, in Greek. So in to Greek? take... In Greek? To, to, 
Yeah, w working with Greek language, working with Aramaic in some cases, working with Hebrew. No, no, not writing in Greek. We don't have Greek texts from anybody in Palestine from the first century, apart from Josephus. I'm then what is, Hetzer, what, is Hetzer what is Hetzer talking about when she says that merchant and trade people give evidence of knowing Greek, especially in a political and administrative role, often tied to commerce and other tasks? I can give you the pages, page 94, page 243, pages 276 to 87 of her study. Right. She's she not talking, about, li she's not talking about literary texts, is she? She's talking about documentary documentary texts. Well, let's let's make a distinction. Yes, absolutely really... make a distinction because it's a big difference between writing out a will and writing a literary epistle. Now, it, again, depending on how you work with with what's available, that may or may not be a great difference. What do you if someone is trading in in doing business in a given language? Uh, and they are able to work in Greek. Are we just going to say, well, they can't? They can do that, but they can't write a literary text. They can't write a short letter. No, one point is that the, that these rural Galileans didn't know Greek. This has been shown fairly conclusively by Mark Chancy that that the idea that Greek was widely known throughout Galilee, in fact, is a modern myth. Uh, and that the ancient sources don't support it. He he bases this on a study of every surviving literary reference to literacy in Galilee and to every surviving material remain, the inscriptions uh, and every, all the documents, everything we have, that in fact outside of the major urban areas of Sepphoris and Tiberias, people didn't speak or write Greek. They knew Aramaic. Peter, of course, didn't come from an urban area like Tiberias or, or Sepphoris. No, but he interacted. He interacted a, as a merchant in the Sea of Galilee area with people who did come from those backgrounds, and he did business. And I've already mentioned the. We example. don't know what kind of how business do you, how he did. Do you, how do you foresee him engaging in ministry when he moves outside? I think the he land? had an interpreter. I mean, d so, just coming so to. So he just traveled with an interpreter wherever he went. Well, he certainly. Or found an interpreter he certainly did no literary Greek. I, I mean, what about the the other? plank of this which is that did he use a you know a secretary coming back to that because uh, when I, just in my very poor understanding compared to you guys understanding of of the the letters you even see it in some of paul's letters for instance that, yes. that it seems that at some points he says i'm going to write this with my own hand it seems like people used uh, yes, kind of scribes absolutely. secretaries and 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 so um is what, what given that that's a possibility yeah. why wouldn't a secretary have been able to write down yeah, the, the complex the complex Greek? so so uh randy richards wrote this book and um he 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 talks about all the various ways secretaries are used i mean paul for example dictated to a secretary now to dictate an oral composition uh requires education just as writing an or writing a composition takes education you have to be educated in order in order to do it so uh, I read through Richard's book, and he says that one, in his book, he says that one of the things that secretaries sometimes did is they would compose a letter for an author. And I looked at what evidence he cited for this, and he didn't cite any evidence. And so I wrote, I wrote him an email, and I said, well, Randy, I said, you know, you say that, that this sometimes happened. I said, did you find any evidence of it? And he wrote me an email back and said, well, no, actually, there is no evidence of it. There is evidence. Oh, what's the evidence? Well, Daryl, if I can ask he you to, to if, if I can I'm ask sorry? you, if if I can ask you to hold that thought, Daryl, we we have to go to a break, and and so we'll come straight back into this. Uh, Daryl, I had to interrupt, and I'm sorry for that, but uh, Bart had made has said there just isn't good evidence of um, this well, practice he any, taking he place. Any, he mm. said any evidence originally. Mm. Now he now he was in the process of explaining, and we should probably let him do that. Uh, the evidence that was being brought forward, or at least was uh, was put up. So let's let's let him do that before I respond, because I think that's only fair. Yeah, thanks. Uh, Cicero mentions an, an incident in which uh, C Cicero is a first first century Roman, uh, very famous author who wrote a lot of letters, and he he mentions one incident in which he was uh, a, a friend of his, Atticus, was asked to to write a full account of what had been going on in Rome. Uh, f for Cicero, and Atticus says that he was he was too tired to do it, and so he had a secretary do it. And uh, this is sometimes used uh, as evidence that sometimes someone would ask someone else to write a letter uh, and sign their name. Mm. So, but when you when you look at what Cicero actually says, 
He doesn't say that when Atticus asked his friend to write it, that Atticus asked him to write it and then sign his, Atticus's name. All he says is that he asked his friend to do it. Mm -hmm. So we don't know whether his fr what his friend did. I mean, we assume that he wrote the letter in his own name rather than Atticus's name. At least that's the conclusion that Richards draws. So that uh, that's the one in, in, that's the one exception that he cites, and then he says uh, that that exception doesn't actually apply. And so then he says, so really, uh, that's the that's the one instance. But yet he keeps the category of sometimes people would write in someone else's name uh, with, with their approval. I think I noted when we discussed this earlier that um, that Bart's working with an early version of what or earlier version of what Richards has done. He's updated uh, his material and he's uh, added more. He's added examples. I don't have them in front of me, but he has added uh, examples to this category that he's talking about. Are you talking about um, his new book or the? Are you talking about a new edition of the old book or the the second book? It's a, it's a, I think it's a second edition of, of the original book and because uh, it was just done a few years ago. And the version that you have cited in your book is, is older. Um, and so he, ha he has, I think, updated the evidence here um, and goes through uh, a handful of examples, uh, some involving Cicero, and I believe there are a few others as well, uh, to talk about this category of where the person works with the style of what it is that someone it, 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 uh, is writing and uh, and, cr and crafts the letter um, in light of conversations with the person that they're working with. I, I would like to move us on, Jensen. I'm sorry, because we, we could keep going on this one for a while, I'm sure. Um, but but I, in a sense, I mentioned just, just a little while ago there, but Paul, and, and in, in a sense, that's where a lot of this material lies, uh, whether Paul was the writer of um, a number of letters found in the New Testament. I mean, first of all, let's be clear, you're, you're certain that Paul did write certain letters, aren't you? Could, could you name a few that, that you, you would quite happily say Paul was the, the writer yeah, of? Yes, sc scholars normally talk about the seven undisputed Pauline letters, which would be Romans, First and Second Corinthians, Galatians, Philippians, First Thessalonians, and Philemon. Mm. So those are undisputed. Uh, it's not technically true, because there's always some person who's going to sure, dispute sure. this area. But, but, but basically, general, everybody yeah. agrees with seven. Consensus, yes. And Daryl is absolutely right what he said at the beginning, that, that there are more debates about some some books than others, uh, and I'm sorry if I didn't give that the impression that, that that's the case, because it's absolutely true. Far more people think that Paul did not write First, Second Timothy, and Titus, for example, the pastoral epistles. That it's it's fairly widespread among uh, scholars outside of the conservative evangelical ranks that Paul did not write those three letters. And there are more debates about Colossians, Ephesians, and Second Thessalonians. And and so with those pastoral epistles. Would even the the recipient be a made up person? W would this Probably, be a sort of yeah. um, you know kind of? It's a double pseudepigraphy. Yeah, yeah in that yeah. sense. Uh, I mean, and, and what are the reasons for thinking? For instance, let's talk Ephesians. Um, why can you look at Romans and say, yeah, Paul wrote that one, uh, and then look at Ephesians and say, mm, no, that, yeah. that's not the same. Well, the the logic scholars use is that if, if you've got seven letters that you're pretty sure. Uh, Paul wrote. And why would you be sure he wrote those? Well, things? it's complicated, okay. <laughs> but, but it, it ends up being that they, they agree enough in terms of writing style, in terms of theology, in terms of historical situation, that they all appear to go back to the same person, okay. and the others differ. So okay. so if you take something like Ephesians, what, what, what you do is you have these seven letters, and you compare this other one to the seven and see whether it, it coincides well enough to think mm. that the person really mm. wrote it or not. And so you look, the, the major things you look at are, uh, is the writing style the same? Uh, you know, people write in different styles. And so when you're reading Mark Twain, you know you're not reading T.S. Eliot. I mean, these are they're different mm. writing styles. Mm. Uh, apart from the subject matter, you look at the theology. Does the are the theological views consistent with what is found in the seven undisputed letters? Uh, so writing style, vocabulary, theology, presupposed historical situation. You look at you, you do it you do it the way you would do anything. If you found an, a letter by say Mark Twain, you can mm. you that somebody says is from Mark Twain, then you you compare it in these ways. Now. Um, Daryl's going to, to, to kind of contest that, that whether Ephesians, for instance, w was not written by Paul. Um, but, but just staying with your kind of line of thought there, Bart, 
Um, why would someone make up that they were Paul writing a letter like Ephesians? And uh, forgive me if I'm wrong in this, but, but isn't Ephesians sort of it's supposed to be one that was written from prison, as it were? So it's quite sort of contextualized within sort of, you know, I'm here in chains and, but, uh, and all that sort of stuff. Yes, uh, so that that is really one of the compelling questions. If somebody somebody else wrote it, claiming to be Paul, why why would he do that? And so what I do in one part of my book is I talk about why what what the motivations were for forgery in the ancient world generally. Since we have lots of examples from the Greek and Roman worlds, Jewish examples, pagan examples, uh, and Christian examples, everybody agree on. You can make a kind of a taxonomy of motives. Uh, categories to, to slot them in. And in most cases with these early Christian writings, what's generally thought is that whoever was writing a book, say, say Paul did not write Ephesians, say someone else did, why would somebody claim to be Paul? They'd claim to be Paul because they were a nobody. Uh, nobody knew who they were. They had no authority, and they had a message that they thought was really important. And they probably thought this is something Paul would have said if he had been here. Uh, they might be right about that, they might be wrong about that, but that's probably what they thought. And in order to get their book read, they didn't claim to be John Schwartz, whom nobody had ever heard of, they claimed to be Paul, and that way people would read the book. Hmm, okay. Um, Daryl, do you want to interact with both aspects, you know, whether Ephesians, wh why you feel Ephesians doesn't, you shouldn't discount Ephesians as, as, as for coming from the hand of Paul, and and whether this um, practice was widespread and, and uh, you know, could have crept into the New Testament? Well, the practice was widespread. There's no doubt about that. And, uh, and in fact, Bart's book in several places shows how widespread the practice was. The question is whether Christians uh, in the community making a case for um, their theology, talking about honesty and integrity in those kinds of categories, um, would do something like this. The other issue that's in the background is, you know, how do these letters get to be circulated in a part of the tradition? Some Nobody writes it. They send it to a church. It's accepted by someone else coming from Paul. But we haven't asked the question, you know, how do you actually post a letter in the ancient world? And what kind of authentication comes with sending a letter from point A to point B? Those kinds of questions that would even allow the community that receives such a letter uh, even think about or consider, well, maybe this is Paul and maybe it isn't. We haven't discussed that at all, but that's an important part of the background. We haven't discussed things like uh, when you look at the vocabulary, for example, in relationship to Ephesians, where, um, where we're told that there are 41 words not found elsewhere in the New Testament and there are 84 not found elsewhere in Paul, and so vocabulary becomes one of the elements in the argument. We don't ask the question, well, what do the numbers look like for Galatians? Well, there are 35 words not found elsewhere in the New Testament, and there are 90 not found elsewhere in Paul, and yet no one disputes the book of Galatians as going back to Paul on the basis of vocabulary. So um, uh, these arguments uh, are presented, but they also cut both, cut both ways, and sometimes they're presented as if they make a clear case when, in fact, uh, they don't make as clear or compelling a cases is sometimes suggested. Can I just say about that? I don't, I don't recall that I used a vocabulary argument for Ephesians. Maybe I did. Uh, but th there, are, there are other reasons. Can, can I just say, though, about one point you made? You know, what, Why would Christians do something like this, you, you ask? But, in fact, we know that Christians did do things like this. We have lots of materials that are not in the New Testament that also support all sorts of uh, ethical values uh, by people who are lying about their identity. So we, it's not a question whether... Christians would do something like this. Christians did do things like this. The question well, is, well, we're ta what we're talking about in terms of these later, uh, some of these later documents, is related to the development of, and this is going to get us into the whole probably background of how diverse Christianity was, but uh, has to do with uh, moving into a polemical direction in which the more, uh, how, how can I say this, um, the proto-Christian, if I can use that term, since we could debate, you know what what we mean, but the point is that which became known as Christianity uh, existed and there were people reacting to that and they were making claims about revelation and experiences to, to trump and to challenge uh, what was being said in the church that was making claims to have apostolic roots. 
Yeah, but I'm thinking uh, about I'm thinking about completely innocent letters like the letter to the Laodiceans, which uh, is not it's not it has no her, uh, heresy axe to grind. It it doesn't seem to be supporting any particular point of view. Uh, it it's somebody claiming to be Paul who absolutely was not Paul, uh, and so. But the church didn't recognize that letter. Well, but no, but the large portions of the church did recognize it. it. It continued to be printed in Latin Bibles in the West for centuries. Uh, it was considered canonical scripture by a large portion of the church for a very long time. The letter to the Laodiceans? Yes. Well, it's in Latin we, Bibles we today. Can get into the, we can get into, well, we, can, uh, we might get into a debate about what is meant by that phrase, but... Uh, that's probably getting too technical. Um, I mean, the, t- t- tell us then, um, Daryl, in a sense, um, for Ephesians, Ephesians itself, um, you feel that y- you don't have to go as sceptical as some some yeah, scholars for example, do go. There are claims, there are claims made that, that uh, there's teaching in Ephesians that, that Paul wouldn't write or that Paul uh, wouldn't say. And th- there are two points to make here. One is the idea that sometimes when I read these works, I have the idea that Paul is a very static theologian, that he can't develop his thinking in any direction, even though he's recognized as one of the most creative theologians of the first century. So that's the first point to make. The second point to make is that, in fact, in many of these cases where we get the claim that Paul doesn't say X, in fact, we can find that he says something very much like X. He may not use the exact terminology, but he certainly works conceptually in the same kind of of world. So, for example, uh, we get claims about what Paul is capable of saying about being carried away by the lust of the flesh in Ephesians 2, 3, and, and we can contrast the negative view about what Paul's, uh, what Ephesians says there with what Paul says in Philippians 3, 4, that he was blameless with reference to the law. And so the claim is, well, those two things don't match. Well, in fact, you see Paul blaming every Jew in Romans 2 and 3 for falling short and for being hypocritical. Um, so he's quite capable of saying those kinds of things. Or we get the idea that, uh, that saved is only a future tense idea in Paul, but we miss in Romans 6 the picture of being brought to new life and the picture of baptism in the first 11 verses of that chapter. So these claims that, that Paul couldn't say X um, have two problems. One, Paul can't develop his theology or express himself, uh, express himself uh, in certain ways uh, or with a certain amount of diversity. And then secondly, and perhaps more importantly, we do have examples in the epistles that everyone suggests of Paul saying very much the kinds of things that is being said he couldn't say or didn't say. And any response, Bob? To yeah, I just think. Uh, I mean, uh, of course, I agree that uh, that Paul's theology can change, and that Paul uh, sometimes can uh, contradict what he said at one point or another, and that in in one place, if he if he says that. Uh, Christians are not raised with Christ yet. In some place else, he says Christians are raised with Christ. If you want to admit that that Paul just contradicts himself, that's fine. But another option is that Paul didn't write both things. My, my now that's, an, that's, that's, a, that's precisely the kind of example, the way of stating the issue that I think has problems in and of itself. Because when Paul says uh, there isn't a resurrection, or Paul says there is a, re- a resurrection, depends entirely on the context in which he's addressing and the kind of uh, in the kind of opponent or view that he is dealing with. On the one hand, you have people in Corinth who are claiming that the full salvation has taken place, if I can say it that way, and that the resurrection has already taken place. And in those kinds of contexts, uh, he's making he's making points about uh, about the return of Christ and the rest of salvation that leads to more restrictive language. But in other cases, he's quite content to say we're already raised. In fact, some people think that the reason why he's got problems in Corinth is people have misunderstood some of what he's already taught. That's not a case of him contradicting himself. That is a case of him engaging uh, the theological view that is causing him to express himself in the way that he is. Yeah, no, that's certainly one way to look at it. I mean, I I think that what's happening in Ephesians is that Paul is taking precisely the position, th- that the author of Ephesians is taking precisely the position that Paul is arguing against in Corinth, that the author of Ephesians uh, 
imagines that the people, that Christians have already been raised with Christ and are enjoying the benefits of salvation now, and that that's the position Paul is against. But doesn't that fit the entire already not yet structure of New Testament theology? I mean, doesn't it's a balancing act, I think. I think it's a balancing okay, act. I mean, so it's, it's I think you do the same thing. No, it's not. It's, of course, the people argue about it. But, but my point is, you do the same thing when you decide that Paul did not write Third Corinthians. Third, I assume, th- you, I assume th- you have Third grounds. Corinthians being a, a letter that was not included in, it's not in included canon. It's not included in the New Testament. I'm sure Daryl thinks Paul didn't write it. And if I asked him for his reasons, he would probably say things about how the theology is different from Paul, the situation is different from Paul, the writing style is different from Paul. So Yeah, we're not going we're, we're, we're gonna, to we're gonna agree on the kinds of things that you look at to try and make these kinds of judgments. And there are many places in the book, I probably should say this, there are many places in the book where I actually agree very much with the with the line of argument that Bart has taken in arguing for the uh, circumstances of certain books, there are also places where he where he takes a view outside the New Testament where I disagree with the judgment that he's made. But and, and so and we're all we are all using these factors. But my my I guess my fundamental complaint here, or at least, and it's not much a complaint against Bart. It's a complaint about the way we have these discussions. Mm. Is that what happens is is that each person writes their book, putting in their point of view, and what tends to happen is, of course, because each person is making the case, there's there is certain evidence that is put on the table, but there's certain evidence that the book itself doesn't engage or doesn't engage quite so directly. So what do you have to do? You have to go to the other voice. Well, the problem there is is that they often do the same thing in reverse uh, for the case that they're making. And so then the problem for the reader is, because after all, our goal here when we started out was to say, well, let's help the layman understand these discussions, uh, is that they're forced to do two reads that really actually never directly engage one another because they're each making their own case. Hmm. It would be good just briefly um because I, I there's other things i'd like to discuss before we run out of time but but for instance second thessalonians now you've already mentioned that first thessalonians you're happy as being pauline uh, is that right yeah, but yeah, you, yeah. you said and but second thessalonians which appears to be on the face of it a, a, a kind of follow-up letter to the church in thessalonica um is is not pauline um very quickly bullet points what what are the reasons for that one for instance not, yeah, not let, being let me just say part of the complication with this conversation and with my book is that we're trying to do this for a lay audience mm. and in fact the, the arguments are complicated of course so i've just they finished, are yes that's I, true <laughs> I've, I've just finished writing a much much longer book for scholars where i deal with these issues and go into considerable detail but it's it's not the sort of thing that uh, is going to work on the show <laughs> of course of course so, so uh, the, the basic thing with second thessalonians is uh is and, and part of, part of the problem is when mm. you when you put it in kind of basic terms, it's quite easy to to undermine that mm. with a counter argument. Mm. But okay, so but here it is. the <laughs> The basic thing is that the the understanding of the end times in Second Thessalonians seems to be different from the understanding of First Thessalonians. That in First Thessalonians, Paul has to tell these people. Paul tells these people that Jesus is coming right away. He's going to come like a thief in the night. It's going to be sudden. It'll be unexpected, and they need to be ready for it. Mm-hmm. In Second Thessalonians, he details an entire scenario that, no, it's not going to come right away. First this has to happen, then this has to happen, then that has to happen. And so don't be put off by thinking that it's going to come right away. Mm. And th- that seems to be contradictory. Just, again, briefly, if you would, Daryl, uh, a response to, to that. Well, there are two parts of it. I mean, obviously, they're, uh, they're dealing in Thessalonica with what's going on at the end, and Paul is responding to that. In the first letter, he gives a generic response, really to reassure them about the fact uh, that, no, they haven't missed out. The second coming hasn't happened yet. Uh, they, everyone's going to participate, including the dead. Uh, the promises that have been made are going to happen. Then the second letter happens. What often happens is, in a second letter, you go into more detail about what you really think because the first letter didn't completely take care of the problem. And I think that's what's going on in Second Thessalonians. That's why you get more sequence. You do have in the early church this tension between uh, coming soon and yet not so soon that other things may occur or other things may happen. And, and here, when we start to enter this discussion, 
we'll get into a discussion of what goes back to Jesus perhaps and what may be a reflection of the early church in some of these texts that relate to the second coming. But just to give one example, in Luke 18, there's a terrific emphasis on how soon justice is going to come on behalf of the disciples. But in the same breath, there's the remark of, will the Son of Man find faith when he comes back, which tells you that it's long enough and problematic enough that some people are not going to have faith by whatever time it happens. And so uh, these tensions are part of what we see in the interaction. Another argument that is sometimes made with regard to Thessalonians is, is that the perspective of Second Thessalonians is, is so developed that it reflects a later period. But what the ten in Thessalonians is telling us is, is that people are, are trying to sort this all out, and um, most people do accept that First Thessalonians is Pauline, and that he's dealing with these issues in the 50s. And so, yeah. again, mm. uh, that's, that's the other half it, of, the, it, of the conversation. Obviously, and we're all about bringing both halves of the conversation together on this program, and it's great to hear you kind of going at it together in this way. Uh, uh, these are extremely technical issues when you really dig into them, and so I'm not expecting us to kind of, in any sense, um, hammer it out in that detail on this show. But it does bring us... To, for me to th this more general point of the fact is daryl that um there are other evangelical scholars who are prepared to to kind of give but the, the 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 fact that pseudography exists and um so for instance ben witherington has has done another detailed sort of look at bart's book uh ben witherington the third i love i love the fact that americans uh, can can do the third we don't get that over here in the uk <laughs> so much but but uh, but but um but anyway the um but 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 I think that what what Ben Witherington would would contest Bart is that um, it it has quite the same um, level of uh, impact that you say it has that, that 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 it was a kind of accepted practice that there was if you like a a, a school of teaching that that yes. w was being represented when someone called themselves Paul yes and and so we shouldn't see this as a as a deceptive thing this, yes. this was simply just sort of you know the way that things happened at the time and obviously you're making a stronger claim in that in the book that, that this was really actually deception yes i am i i used to have ben's uh, point of view for years i used to teach my students this that it was common in philosophical schools for a student to write a book and sign his teacher's name to it because the teacher's the one who gave him all his ideas and that it was a perfectly acceptable practice. Uh, and I, I thought that until a few years ago when I decided to look up the evidence for it. And what I found was uh, Christian author after Christian author, commentary after commentary saying this, but nobody citing the evidence that this happened in the ancient world. Now I finally found some authors who talked about the evidence and so I looked up the evidence and it is virtually non-existent uh, that in the ancient world this happened in the philosophical schools. The evidence has to do with the Pythagorean schools in particular and one one particular Neoplatonist author named Iamblichus who says it happened. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, he was writing 800 years after the school that he's talking about and he shows no no, no evidence of knowing knowing what he's talking about so much so that the Pythagorean Korean scholars say that in fact this isn't true uh, and so you know if somebody says this was a common practice my my response is always show me the evidence we're gonna get your response to that Daryl in just a moment's time uh, sorry to have to cut in again uh, do join us on the other side of a short break I mean obviously you're not taking that position you feel that you you, you ha but hasn't firmly established that the works in question are pseudographical but Obviously, there are other scholars you respect who do take that position. Do you think Bart makes a good enough case for the fact that real deception was taking place and that, that this yes, wasn't? I think in many cases, I actually agree with him, that I think that the, this is an attempt to deceive. It's often an attempt to use the name of a luminary to give credibility to a work that otherwise wouldn't have it if you knew who the real author was. There is a tweener category that we haven't discussed at all that's kind of more difficult, and that is, what do you do when you represent the theology of someone uh, as being from them or sourced in them, even though you do the writing, but the ideas are really a reflection of the theology of the person who uh, originally wrote, and you, and you write in their name because you belong to their school. Now, this is like the Pythagorean example that he was using, but I think it's an, an important tweener category. I know of an example in my own lifetime in which someone wrote and updated 
a work and abridged it. Uh, Bart will appreciate this illustration, I think. Uh, Lewis Sperry Chafer uh, was the founder of Dallas Seminary, wrote a long work on eschatology. Well, John Walbert updated his material and reduced it down in an edited form uh, with Roy Zook. But they continue to present it as Chafer's theology, even though the writing and the words now updated and discussed, including some issues Chafer didn't directly address, but Walbert felt like, well, this is what Chafer would have said, uh, ended up being in the material. And so uh, when you get someone representing someone else who feels a debt to someone, uh, then that's a kind of tweener category. Then I think it's a little harder to say this is outright deception. Um, uh, because because the thought and the impetus for what's being said is coming from the person who you're giving credit to. Hmm. Do you want to respond briefly, Bart, and, and then yeah, we'll, we'll I, come I to this? Yeah, I agree. There there are uh, nuances and complications. Um, what I'll say about early Christianity is that that sort of thing did happen a lot, uh, but. What happened is that people claiming to be representing Paul's theology took absolutely opposite points of view about that that theology, and so uh, so you have you had people, for example, forging works in the names of Paul who were Marcionites, and they said we're simply representing what Paul thought, and you had Gnostics who uh, wrote books in the name of Paul saying we're just representing what Paul really yeah, thought. I'm not talking I, I, to be. Uh, I mean, what we're now doing is moving into an whole area of, of how Paul's name is being used polemically and in some cases I think would be a misrepresentation of what we actually know about what Paul said. That's a different kind of example than the example I'm raising where we're talking about someone who is trying to represent and, if you will, extend what Paul Paul said as opposed to contradict him. So I think we have to keep those categories somewhat distinct. Yeah, but the problem is that these people didn't think that they were doing it polemically. They thought they were really doing what Paul would have said if he were alive in this situation. How can you be a Marcionite, reject the Old Testament, and think that you're doing what Paul's doing? You mean you, you, mean you think all the Marcionites thought that they were wrong? I think the, No, I think the Marcionites, uh, the Marcionites, uh, who argued, who, who rejected a whole lot of the Old Testament, couldn't have worked with Paul, who has the Old Testament chopped through all his writings. They certainly did work with Paul. Paul was their hero. They thought that your no, view about Paul's Paul, view of the, the Old, Old Testament, Testament was wrong. I know about the Old Testament, Testament, but they thought that Paul rejected the Old Testament because the, the, the letter kills reading? and the Spirit how gives life. They, how can they do that, and how can they do that and read Paul Never and under the Old Testament <laughs> talk all the way through? Right. In other words, if they disagree with you, they knew they were wrong. No, that's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is, is that Paul is using the Old Testament all the way through. He's talking they don't about think he did. They think he chucked it aside and didn't use yes. it. Yes. You they, know about the Marcionites. They, he, he cites it. He they cites said it he didn't cite the Old Testament. I, those were interpolations in his letters. Scripture. Yes, those were interpolations they, in his won't, letters. They won't use it as Scripture? Yes, because those were interpolations in Paul's letters. That's well, what they that's said. My point. That's they, they were honest. My point. They were honestly doing what they thought was right. It, to say uh, otherwise well, is not to do history. It's to do theology. Now you may want to do theology instead of history, but I'm talking about history. Well, unfortunately, when those two things are brought together, you can't split them apart like that. You, how you can have an author who writes a Romans or a First Corinthians or a Second Corinthians, the letters that we accept running through the depth of the kind of argument that you're talking about in the Old Testament and have someone say, oh, that's all interpolation. That really doesn't come from Paul. That's what the Marcionites did with Luke, okay? But yes. what the Marcionites what they, did But they did it in good conscience. It's we, not we, that they we, thought they we, were wrong. We're gonna, we're gonna, I'm going to draw a close on that one, guys, because uh, <laughs> it sounds like we could be going on, on that one for a while. But I want to thank you both for, for coming uh, on, the, on the line. Firstly, Daryl and, and Bart here in the studio. Um, Okay, Bart, um, you, at the end of the day, um, you feel that this is where the evidence points. Uh, I guess you feel, you know, as we sum up, that, that Daryl is perhaps defending essentially a, a view of inerrancy or, or uh, that, that he, he obviously has reasons for what he believes. He's got the ev evidence, but you feel it's, is it because he's coming from a particular viewpoint that he, he's defending? Yeah, well, deep down, that's what I think, is that, that uh, 
that the only people who really deny that there are any pseudepigraphy in the New Testament are, are people who have theological reasons for denying it. You won't find anybody, for example, in, our, in Daryl, my country, you won't find anybody teaching at a non-conservative evangelical school that, that takes that line. Uh, it doesn't matter what school you go to. You can go to Ivy League schools, Princeton, Harvard, Yale, Brown. You can go to major universities, North Carolina, Florida, Kentucky, uh, Kansas, Texas. And you can go to private schools. You go anywhere, anybody teaching anything about the New Testament who is not a conservative evangelical thinks that there are pseudepigrapha in the New Testament. The only people who say that there are not are conservative evangelicals, and that's not an accident. It's because there's a theological reason for saying that there aren't pseudepigraphy. In, and, and I understand the theological reason, because these people who, who wrote pseudepigrapha were lying about their identity and trying to deceive people. And if the Bible is the inerrant, inspired word of God, you can't have people lying in it. Thank you for joining us today. Uh, Daryl, um, obviously that's uh, you know a big statement for, for Bart to be finishing with. Um, are you are you defending it because of um, the, you know the, the fact that this would seriously create a theological problem? And, and Bart's already accused you possibly of doing theology rather than history when it comes to the way you you look at these books. Well, I think the problem is is again we see in Bart's summary an oversimplification of what of what is going on. I, I think I think in fairness to him that it's true that many people do defend this because they have a theological viewpoint. The question is how they come to that theological viewpoint and whether or not they, in their own thinking, have worked through um, uh, the rationale for believing that. Uh, I came up, my story is the exact opposite of Bart's. I came out of a non-Christian home um, and uh, came to a more conservative theological belief because I think that is what I see in the materials and the arguments that are put forward that people find some degrees argue are so compelling, I'm trying to suggest are not as compelling as people are putting forward. In fact, there are real serious problems with, with some of the arguments, and those problems undermine the case that is being made. A lot of people who end up in universities actually have an anti-theological ax to grind, and so the same bias, if you will, that he's accusing me of can be placed on many people who are teaching in the humanities in their reaction to religion. It's been fascinating having you both on, gentlemen. Uh, thank you both for uh, what's been a technical in some areas, but also um, really interesting sort of aspects that have been drawn out about the, the, the motivations and justifications for why these kinds of uh, debates take place.